Hi, everyone. Greetings. Welcome. Nice to be in the temple together. Excellent thing. There's a, the nobility of being, doing, I suppose doing nothing together, the nobility of doing nothing together, <laughs> the royal idleness of Zaza. <laughs> but it's a wonderful thing. So thank you. Uh, just taking you in now. So while we're waiting for the rest of the bodhisattvas to amble in, and uh, welcome everyone who just arrived. So while we're waiting, as people mercy and amble in, meditation, let's try that. Mm. Let's try it again with the original uh, a Zoom setting that works for music. There we are. <laughs> ah. Here we are then. <laughs> Where are we then? Here is what it's called. It's what it was called before the earth was made. Here was here. So uh, I think You know, just feel what it's like to be here. Feel what it's like to be you. It's one of the one of the great old early cons. My name is Wee Chow. I'm asking you, what is Buddha? And uh, the teacher said, you are Wee Chow. You are I don't know whoever you are. You are. Courtney Killer, <laughs> Christopher Johnson, <laughs> Gene Foster. Yeah. Look no further for here. <laughs> it's rather wonderful. <laughs> here, here is, you know, ultimately, that's the ultimate answer for any question is, oh, this is life. Here I am, here we are. So for the moment, feel, that's what feeling the time. Um, feeling the time, there's a line from one of Du Fu's probably most famous poem about being in the ruins of the great city of Chang'an. And um, feeling the time. And if the worst comes to the worst, which it had in his case, that's what you can do. You can feel the time. But you know, the worst often, you know, it's always too early to despair. So here we are. We have here. <laughs> We have, I am we Chow. So let's just feel the here-ness, feeling the time. And you feel how it unfolds. And the other old saying, it comes out of your own heart, your own breast, and covers heaven and earth. Feeling the time. Whatever your time is, you know. As you can see from behind me, it's daffodil time here. And the persistence of the daffodils and snow and sleet and 
just being daffodils, you know. <laughs> and someone, Amaryllis in Denver, was saying, oh, it's nice to see them. We're so far from that up in the mountains. <laughs> or other people in other places. Eduardo is here somewhere in Chile. It's definitely not daffodil time. <laughs> or in Tasmania. It's not daffodil time. It's summer in the southern hemisphere. So. But feeling the time, and we notice that it's always with us from the moment we're born. And presumably, I don't know, it's one of those interesting mysteries. Um, as we die, feeling the time. It's kind of our job. You know. Feeling the silence. There's the quality of the silence being that nothing is needed. We do not need to add or subtract. There's not yet a problem. A problem has not yet arisen in the universe. Feeling the time. I have the, um, I'm not sure whether it's deepening practice or deepening um, lunacy on my part, but I have more and more unaccountable happinesses. <laughs> so I've noticed that um, it's winter here and, and it's sort of been cold and lots of rain and we had snow, which is unheard of and everybody's incredibly thrilled about. Yeah. But, um, except when they're not. But um, uh, I notice I, I wake up and as usual I wake up the night and I walk out into the living room and it's already a temple with a firelight and, you know, and there's unaccountable happiness, you know. Fortunately, I'm awake to experience this. To experience the silence and the firelight. And not to have the thought that I should get some more sleep and so on. It's an easy thought to come by, but it's just here. We're here. We're here. Not to have a different body. Not to have a different anything, really different companions, different friends. Uh, so here's the, here's my, th here's the thing today that I wanted to, I don't know, just drop into the room, into the temple. Master Dongwo, it says, it means East Wall, and, and uh, Master East Wall asked Drangzo, this thing called the Tao, where does it exist? It's a great question. Is where is it? Where is your Buddha nature? Where is whatever you're calling it? You know. Drangsa said, "There's no place it doesn't exist." Come," said Master Eastwall. "You must be more specific." Which is fair enough. <laughs> it's like. He's going to give him a run for his money, you know. Uh, it's in the ants and crickets. As low as that. It's in the panic grass. But that's lower still. It's in the tiles and shards. How can it be so extreme? It's in the piss and shit. Master Eastwall made no reply says so that's that moment when uh somehow you know it's rather fun isn't it and um drunks is a bit of a show off you know he he shows going down the stages with the dignitary you know and uh master eastwall made no reply and drunks said we wander in borderless vastness great knowledge enters in and we don't know where it will ever cease, or where it will ever end. Great knowledge enters in. 
and we don't know how it comes or where it goes. It feels true, you know, when we're not grasping and making things, great knowledge enters in and we don't know where it will ever end. And there's a, another column that sort of somehow reminds me of this one, and it's um, a famous column, more famous probably than this, but it's, um, and it's the same thing, uh, Bodhidharma uh, got an audience with Emperor Wu, who was a very notable emperor, a very powerful figure, and very interested in the Dharma and would make fun temples and, and uh, he had a certain sort of passion in a way, he felt a bit mannered, but he could tell he was really trying to find a way he would sell himself, auction himself, he would sell himself uh, as a slave to the monastery, you know, and he would garden. Of course, everyone knew he was an emperor, so don't piss him off. <laughs> but uh, but uh, still, you know, there's something. He's an emperor gardening, you know. And uh, and then somebody, was one of his rich um, patrons would buy him back and so he could become emperor again, things like that. So he was kind of dedicated to the Dharma and thought about it a lot. But he also thought it was something you could manufacture or purchase in some way. And it's very hard to get out of that part of the mind, you know. The part of the mind is almost always here. And uh, Drungs's thing about it just comes and we don't know where it will ever end is a different kind of thinking from that, you know. And so, and I think, I think when we start, um, when we start the Dharma, we're always sort of trying to, you know, it's like a, we're always trying to purchase it in some way, you know, and, uh, yeah, and, um, so, uh, or make it, it's just like the sort of things we achieve in life, and we can't really, um, and it's very hard to have the idea, but, 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 if I don't X, what then, you know? And so, here's the emperor, and the emperor says, uh, what is the first principle of the holy teaching? And uh, Bodhidharma famously said, vast emptiness, nothing holy. It's in the ants and the crickets, in other words. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> and so you, you have the same descent here. Well, he also, the first thing he asked, is not recorded in the koan, but um, I have uh, funded many temples. What merit have I earned? The idea was you've got merit and then you'd have a more favorable rebirth or better time in the afterlife or things like that. And... Uh, and Bodhidharma, you know, famously said, no merit, which was a kind of good way to get his attention because usually you want to get funded if you're a spiritual teacher. <laughs> Something I know about personally. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and they even claim to say, well, I think you'll have an extremely favorable rebirth and maybe become a Buddha in your next life. You know? So anyway, Bodhidharma, none of that horse shit for Bodhidharma. It's like... Um, <laughs> He said, no merit. And the emperor says, well, then what is the first principle of the holy teaching? You can tell the emperor's going down his, his list of, oh, in that case, then what? You know, which is kind of smart, you know, nice. And he says, vast, em no, no first principle, vast emptiness, nothing holy. And you can tell if you're really there, you can feel the, the here-ness coming and the presence starting to spread out, you know, things going quiet and inside, you know. You just vast emptiness, nothing holy. And so then uh uh then um so what's the first principle? Vast emptiness, nothing holy, and you can feel that it's spreading, you can feel the the vastness sort of somehow entering the conversation and people sort of getting lost in the silence, you know. And so, and then the emperor sort of comes to, he sort of blinks and he says, well, who, who is this standing in front of me? Who are you? And Bodhidharma says, I do not know. And, and then the conversation just, nothing happened. Like, 
it falls into the silence and then after a while the emperor goes back to his life and Bodhidharma leaves the court and crosses the great river and gets on with his the next part of his life which is mainly deepening his practice and teaching a few people and um, and the uh, but you can tell it's the same kind of conversation you know the per the person who knows something keeps going down the list to find something solid to stand on and uh, there isn't you know it's the old joke about the bad news is we're falling the good news is there's no no bottom you know so it's like that so <laughs> i still find that funny i know it's corny but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but <laughs> it's good to know when you think you're in trouble you know <laughs> so, <laughs> So yeah, so you can feel the similarity in the two koans and how also they're both showing off a bit, you know, um, Bodhidharma's showing off to the emperor a little bit, you know, saying, well, you just don't get it, I'm sorry, you may be an emperor. And so there's that. So, um, and, and I think the the thing about it's in, it's in the, the grass, it's in the tiles and shards. Um, the incredibly common thing, you you know, any ancient site of an ancient civilization, you'll find pottery shards, right? You know, you wander around Arizona, the old Anasazi sites, and they're just littered with pottery with little bits of black, you know, design on them, fragments of black design. And, uh, but, you know, anywhere, you know, you wander around some great texts were made from shards in Egypt, you know. That's all we have, you know. Some of the great myths, things like that. So, um, so uh, shards are so common and disregarded, you know. And he said, well, it's in the shards, you know. And it's in your own, it's in you. You know, what if it's in, in you? then you might not be what you think. Here's a, here's a kind of nice thing from um, W.H. Auden. Um, somebody just put out this vast collective, collected writings of his, which is thousands of pages. Uh, but, and he said, you can't, you can't be taught to recognize a sacred being. You have to be converted. In other words, you have to go, you have to be caught and welcomed into that place. So, the Tao seizes you, you know. and I think meditation's like that. Um, and uh, Auden sort of always trying to twist things into a kind of Christian language, which is sort of interesting. But but um, you can tell that you don't need that. You don't need to call it a sacred being. It could be a sacred moment or a sacred insight or anything. But you are converted, and I think that's what we do in in meditation. Instead of trying to understand the sacred, we just go there. And that's going to have to be good enough. It could be worse, you know. <laughs> and anyway, Auden had a, one of the other writers who's not so well known now, but um, of his group who, you know, would hang out together in a pub and share their, insert, share their writing. Tolkien was one of them, but this guy, it was Charles Williams. Um, and he said, one is aware that a phenomenon being holy itself is laden with universal meaning without changing what it is. A hand lighting a cigarette is the explanation of everything. A foot stepping from the train is the rock of all existence. Two light dancing steps by a girl appear to be what all the schoolmen, all the old philosophers, the philosophers, all the schoolmen were trying to express. And so, um, and I think we understand that, you know, the newness quality of what's here, the thusness of things. And uh, is the old comment, what is this? <laughs> What is this? What is this? And you can tell it's, it's tiles and shards, it's whatever it is, panic grass, it's all the stuff that uh, Buddy that all the stuff that um, Zhuangzi talks about. And you can tell he likes some, um, he 
he's trying to, he's like shocking people, but it's not really just because he likes shocking people, though he probably does. But you can tell that there's a way in which you're stepping out of the way you perceive the world. And, and in a certain way, uh, some of the great old masters, Linji, was one said, you turn the light backwards, so, and suddenly you have a mirror onto yourself in the way you see the world. It's not really a mirror onto you, but it's in the mirror onto how you see things and how you make the world. And, um, and that's okay, but you, you, know, you know when you're really, really upset about something and then you realize, hang on, this isn't such a problem. <laughs> you know, that's when the mirror comes. You know? you, oh my God, this is a catastrophe. And you know, this is what, um, this is what you know, daily news is all about. This is a huge problem. I don't know. You know. <laughs> I don't think it belongs in the conversation right now, that sort of thing. So, um, so you notice that. And you notice if you get really upset with your friend or a kid or a parent or whoever it is you fancy getting upset with, you'll notice there's a feeling of being caught. And, and what we're caught in is the dream, a dream of who we are. And when we turn the light backwards, we're not caught in that anymore. You know, we don't have to know. It's like Buddy Dharma. You don't have to know who you are. I do not know. It's fine. You know, a fine response. But it's when we're mad about something, it's completely full of knowing. You know, we object to something. Well, what if I don't object to that? You know, um, is it necessary? Is will it help? Will objecting help? <laughs> Yeah, somebody was uh, pretty short sure dying, and uh, somebody said, well, why aren't you more upset? And the person said, um, would it help? <laughs> and there's something about uh, the, that thing about um, being able to turn the light backwards. I've told this story, but it just keeps coming back, so you know, it must belong here. When my father was dying, and, uh, and I had, after not, you know, not seeing him very much in my life, actually, after I left home, seven, 16 or 17. And um, then, uh, but anyway, I went back to visit him in the hospice in Australia. And he was, um, and so I'd walk in and, you know, I would visit him once a day. And, you know, sometimes he'd be kind of, you know, what delirious, really, wandering, I don't know, delirious is right, wandering, but other times he'd be right there. And I noticed that he didn't want to watch television, watch sports, which he was fanatical about, and uh, or anything like that. He, he wanted to take things in, and he didn't want to be sympathized with, which was sort of, you could tell that he didn't object, but it was boring, and there were more interesting things to be, if I'm dying, I don't have to... I don't have to pretend I care about that stuff, sort of thing. <laughs> there, there, you'll recover. No, I won't. <laughs> that kind of thing. Or, or, oh, it's so terrible you won't recover. I don't know. You know like that. So it's, I don't know. Yeah. So he was in that state. But anyway, this morning I walked in, maybe it was one of the last mornings I saw him, and I said, what do you think of all day in bed? And he said, well, I'm thinking about my attitude. Well, not my attitude to the butcher, my attitude to my attitude. So he's starting to get the, the light turning back, you know. I, I thought, oh, well, I don't know, he never read anything I wrote, and, uh, <laughs> and it was like, <laughs> he, somehow he got it, you know. He got it with the, a very ordinary life. He got that, oh, I can turn the light back. And we'll notice as you go through, that's why there are a lot of cons. You, you actually get, you know, everybody has certain awakening experiences where you get something and you feel, I don't know what you, you know, you feel, oh, and we see through, we're no longer upset with something we're upset with or we no longer have a certain, I don't know, fear or grudge or greed or compulsion, you know. And we can see that there's more love without all those reasons. But then, you know, uh, and we can see, and so then you start seeing your, your attitude, you know, in a way, and you start seeing through your attitude. As my father said, then you start seeing through your attitude to your, your attitude. <laughs> and so there's a, 
there's a the the old the old um, the old uh, Chinese saying was like a description of the universe like there are two mirrors and there's a candle in the middle between them so they reflect infinitely back so we have an infinite reflection of our attitudes really and the Zen solution is you just don't have to be you know I don't know you just don't have to uh, worry about all that what is Buddha you are I'm gonna pick on Courtney again because she's in my my view <laughs> you are Courtney <laughs> And they, yeah, you can't do anything about that. And also, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to be something different. You don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be, um, you know, Alan is in my, my view too. It's fine to be Alan and uh, you don't have to take it too seriously. You know? So, like that. So I think the thing about the, it's in the tiles and shards, it's in the, piss and the shit, it's in the panic grass, it's in the ants and the crickets. Um, it's true that there's something marvelous about the ability to both see the minute and realize the vastness is always with us. And every time we, every time we sit down and begin to meditate, somehow the vastness is with us, and it's inside us and outside us. And so it's, it's, it's never not here with us, you know, and it's a tremendously moving thing. It's in your own heart. You know. And, um, okay, I'm for that. <laughs> it's like we have it with us, we can't get away from it. So let's sit a bit and, um, and, uh, oh, here's a great thing I found. Um, I forgot, but I found, um, just before we sit, here's a, this is a Milosh thing, which is saying the same thing as um, Lausa. Uh, it's translated by Lillian Valley and Cheswell Milosh. We were, we were riding through frozen fields in a wagon at dawn. A red wing rose in the darkness. And suddenly a hare ran across the road. One of us pointed to it with his hand. That was long ago. Today, neither of them is alive, not the hare nor the man who made the gesture. Oh, my love, where are they? Where are they going? The flash of a hand, streak of movement, rustle of pebbles. I ask not out of sorrow, but in wonder. The awe of the hearness of things, and um, the uh, there's, there's something else I'm looking for here. I think I might be able to get it. Um, oh yeah, um, this is um, Lewis Carroll. I'm sure I'll take you with pleasure. The Queen said, "Tuppence a week and jam every other day." Alice couldn't help laughing as she said, I don't want you to hire me and I don't care for jam. It's very good jam, said the Queen. <laughs> well, I don't want any today at any rate. Uh, well, you couldn't have it if you did want it, the Queen said. The rule is jam tomorrow and jam yesterday, but never jam today. <laughs> Vast emptiness, nothing holy. <laughs> It must come sometimes to jam today, Alice objected. No, it can't, said the Queen. It's jam every other day. Today isn't any other day, you know. I don't understand you, said Alice. It's dreadfully confusing. So, never jam today. <laughs> Bells today. Bells <laughs> today.
So we could sit with any any one of those sayings because you can tell that's how koans get made. There's something that allows us to see through how we see. Or it gives us a hint or something like that, you know. They're like a... a, a um, Yeah, they're a bit like a, they're like an environment or a cathedral, perhaps, or a chapel. But they're like also like a dream that they work on us without us having to know much about it. You know? And and that's all right. We don't have to. The movement to understand is a kind of narrowing, really. Master Eastwall asked Zhuangzi, "This thing called the Tao, where does it exist?" There's no place it doesn't exist. Come, you must be more specific. It's in the ants and crickets. As low as that? It's in the panic grass, but that's lower still. It's in the tiles and shards. How can it be so extreme? It's in the piss and shit. <laughs> Master Eastwall made no reply. And Zhuangzi said, we wander in borderless vastness. Great knowledge enters in and we don't know where it will ever end. So any part of the, you know, any part of that that touches you you know, the koan touches us, doesn't it? And it just touches us, or touches our heart, or seizes us. And in a way, that's what practice does. And that's why we come to the temple, because in a way, we're in it. And it has us. And it, and it can be very annoying sometimes. But, but nonetheless, it's good to have the universe interested in us. And that's what's going on. So, yeah. We wander in borderless vastness, great knowledge enters in, and we don't know where it will ever end. And just any part of that little story that touches us, we just let it keep company with us, let it act upon us, take the ride. And if the mind suddenly starts working on some other problem, uh, then you don't make a f don't find fault with that either. You just turn. Or you just notice you don't even have to turn. You notice oh, it's already here. This thing called the Tao. What is it? Where is it? It's in, <laughs> in the ants and crickets. <laughs> That's where it is. <laughs> In the borderless vastness we wander. Great knowledge enters in. That's called here. Here, we're here, it's here. The whole of my life is here. We don't know where it will ever end. So, you know, when you meditate, um, since you're not trying to get anywhere, we might say that um, you're already here. <laughs> and that's incredibly wonderful. Here I am. It's incredibly delightful. And so all you have to, you don't have to make it delightful if it's not delightful and you feel like I'm not going to be delightful today. <laughs> you can't pull that over me. <laughs> but, but if it takes you over, it's none of your business. <laughs> and that might happen. Presence and hereness might just appear. In the silence, anything might appear. What is this thing called the Tao? 
birds and the ants and crickets. We wander in borderless vastness. Great knowledge enters in and we don't know where it will ever end. Ants and crickets, tiles and shards.
We wander in boundless vastness. Great knowledge enters in and we don't know where it will ever end. Where is this thing called the Tao? There is no place it does not exist. We wander in borderless vastness, in boundless vastness. Great knowledge enters in. Knowledge is something we learn and know. Great knowledge was just always there. Great knowledge enters in and we don't know where it will ever end. <laughs> In great knowledge there's nowhere else but here. So that's what here is. <laughs> I read a long piece on, not long, but actually it was a short piece, but it seemed to take a while, for, um, I don't know, a Buddhist magazine about, uh, they asked me to just write something. So I wrote about here and how here was here before anything else and before the universe began and so on. And, and, uh, and then, the editor later said, well, I thought you were going to tell us something about meditation. <laughs> so so uh, there you are. <laughs> it's a borderless vastness. So, um, yeah. Alison, do you want to say anything? Do you have anything you want to say about here or there or whether you can ever get jammed today? <laughs> uh, I think not not anything to say this morning. Michael Wilding, what is it? Um, it's uh, it's alive. <laughs> it's the wind. So come on, answer. What is meditation? It's not meditation. Why not? It's alive. <laughs> Jesse's here somewhere. Jesse, what do you have to say? Mm. Uh, <clears throat> well, we're preparing to relocate to Hawaii, which feels like a long journey that's been stretching out since before time began. And people keep asking me, are you excited yet? And I look and I go, no, <laughs> I'm not excited yet. And some part of me goes, wait a minute, is there something wrong with me? Should I be excited? Should I be more excited about this? And, and um, I don't know, I just look around and it's, it's just here. So it's kind of a fun, am I on the journey yet or not? And it's just here, it's just here, it's just here. Thank you. Very good. Rolf, I don't know you, I don't think I know you, but do you have anything to say? What is it? <laughs> Ah, oh, there you go. Uh, yes, I'm not sure, John, whether here's in Melbourne or uh, Hobart. <laughs> uh, but, um, yes, um, um, it's good being here. Thank you.
they're here. Every now and again they ask you and you say I don't have anything to say, which is kind of very respectful of the silence, but I'm asking you this. I'm just trying again. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, all I know is today everything went so well. I had no trouble anywhere, anything. I met it here on time and I had uh, 20 minutes to spare. And uh, that normally doesn't happen. Uh, and it's wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, very good. <laughs> okay. Um... Kind of fun. Uh, um, Eduardo is here somewhere too. Oh, here he is. Do you have anything to say? You know that old thing, say a word of Zen. You know, say a word of Zen for us. What oh, is my, my Tao <clears throat> made a quick turn last Friday. I was playing badminton and suddenly it fell and I got an open cut here. Wow. So it was big turn in my towel. <laughs> I'm recovering now. Very good. Jan Bergen, do you have anything to say? Good morning. I've been. I was meditating, watching the um, the rain clouds go in and out of the redwood forest where I live. John Joseph, anything to say? What is it? Ants and crickets, owls and shards. I love that. Uh, I love that poem by Williams, you know, where just um, the hand lighting the cigarette or, or the um, stepping, the foot stepping off the train, you know, is the whole basis of, uh, of the universe. And um, I uh, um, sometimes for breakfast, I'll have leftovers from previous nights and I put hot sauce on. And <laughs> this morning meditating, I guess I put too much hot sauce on because I felt like a furnace. <laughs> yeah, ants and crickets, cows and charters. Excellent. Uh, Angela in Tasmania, do you have anything to say in the file? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I was struck by your what you said about the koan as an environment. And I suppose I, for myself, I also experience the environment as a koan. So the ants and crickets, literally, the, the panic grass. Um, <clears throat> and I was really just very moved by Michael's music and the way it always seems to just express um, and particularly today with, with the koan, it expresses just the coming and going of things and that wonderful through line <clears throat> of the note underneath it all, the here. So that's all. Thanks. Thank you. Nice to see your Southern Hemisphere fire before dawn. Alan Williamson, do you have anything to say? Ah, oh, hang on, you got to you got to unmute. Although it's kind of interesting to see you talking, and it's magical in a way. Yeah, now we can hear you thinking if I would have anything to say, uh, there were crickets involved in my first profound meditation experience, which was when I was at the uh, McDowell Colony and went and sat out on a stone in the woods. And it was the end of summer and I could hear the cricket song very strongly in the grass. So, uh, 
crickets. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Jean Foster is right next door on the screen. Do you have anything to say? What is it? Maybe I muted you again by mistake. Try again. Now, okay. can you hear me now? Okay. Oh, I, when you were talking, you mentioned uh, wandering in vastness. I was thinking, is it wandering or wondering in great vastness? And the, the, weird, the weird great vastness I've been involved in lately is income taxes. And I feel like I'm wandering in this vastness and I don't know how to do it. And it's driving me crazy. <laughs> some, of, some of the earliest cuneiform clay tablets were taxes. And <laughs> it's like the bureaucratic hall. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. You know what we're going to do? Oh, you know. Courtney. And then we'll go on to more meditation. Mm. What is it? Uh, it's anxiety. It's an anxiety bomb for me this morning, but, uh, some relief in the idea of not having to figure it out. Excellent. Yeah, that's nice. Thank you. The sound of the temple bell. I sometimes think of it as ancient, but it's actually eternal. The temple bell. Everything rings. We wander in borderless vastness, great knowledge enters in, and we don't know where it will ever end. This thing called the Tao where does it exist? Zhuangzi said, there's no place it doesn't exist. Here, we're here. Nice being here. This thing called the Tao, where does it exist? Where does it exist? There's no place it doesn't exist. There's no sound in where it is not present, no sight. We wander in borderless vastness, great knowledge enters in, and we don't know where it will ever end. <laughs> Here we are.
Where are we? Here. <laughs> but can't you explain Zen? Here. Michelle Riddle, give us a word of Zen, as they say, without explanations, without reason. <laughs> uh, sitting in between where I think the jam is not, that's where the Tao is. Very good. Okay. <laughs> a straddle. Jeff Svoboda. Um, just uh, super happy to be here, wherever, wherever this is. <laughs> wherever here is James Anthony. <laughs> oh, it's just another cold day. Very good. So, um, uh, I think Jesse and Amaryllis are going to take us out. Is that right? Um, excellent. To set endless heartache to rest I vow to walk through every wisdom gate I vow to live the great Buddha way Much Amaryllis and Jesse and Michael. <laughs> you see, you don't um, actually get to be a Zen teacher by behaving perfectly. <laughs> it's really fun to have you having fun. Thank you, everyone, uh, all those who did everything. Amaryllis and Jordan was on for five minutes. And, and uh, thank you, everyone from everywhere. 
And um, I don't know. Oh, money. If you want to give us money, PacificSend.org. <laughs> we we for that. And um, also, it's just lovely to see you. You know, it's lovely to. You can feel the the quality of. We're here together, and in fact, the whole then the galaxies are here, and the, the penguins from Tasmania, and the Arctic foxes, and everybody's here. The whales. So thank you. I guess um, there's probably something I forgot to say I'm supposed to say. Next week I'll be here. Um, JJ's doing this great. If you didn't notice, JJ's doing this amazing um, Zen Luminaries program on one Monday a month. So check that out and turn up for it. Lewis Hyde was last month and this month is somebody else. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you all. It's a great thing. And there's other interesting programs going on too. So... Thank you.